Well, that's, uh, you know, motivated by love, by compassion. By the wish to achieve enlightenment for the welfare of all beings. Mm -hmm. okay. I won't do a long meditation for the purpose today, I guess. But, um, <clears throat> I had a little bit of a different idea earlier, but then this morning I was thinking to start, maybe I'll start with um, a little bit, so a little bit of story and um, my own, you know, um, about my own connection to prayer wheels is because I think it gives a good context for what I'm talking about. But, um, and I, you know, um, I guess um, let's get to the book I edited. What year was it? A long time ago, 2000. So it came out 24 years ago. Um, yeah, and I guess like uh, I'm sort of like there are various things I wanted to sort of talk about today, but um, I think it's useful two different two different things. One is what's what is the place of the ma mani corlo, right? Mani wheel, let's call it prayer wheel is English term, right? In the um, Tibetan, Indo Tibetan, Central Asian Buddhist practice. You know, what do the traditional commentaries say? What is its place in that tradition? Um, and then also, though, how can um, how can we how, how can we relate to that practice? Um, there's a different, there's another question. How can anybody relate to that? Any person, you know, kind of relate to that practice? And also, I think, yeah, sharing the story of how, of how that practice is sort of also culturally interacting between the... Uh, Central Asian traditions and and tradition, you know, spreading uh, throughout other parts of the world is part of what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but actually, I'll start with beginning. I'll start at the beginning with my own exposure. I think let me start with that, just because I think it captures something of what the you know what tradition is like. So, um, and actually, I wasn't going to start here, but recently, uh. It gets at who I was at the time. So it was the, it was the 1990, early 90s, I think 91, uh, when I first came across prayer wheels in Nepal. But I'll share something first just about myself because it gets a context of my own connection, I think. Is before that, I, I was recently graduated from college at that time, a couple of years out of college. And I actually recently a friend of mine who was one of my closest friends in college, uh, was he died. But before he died, he wanted to talk. So we hadn't been in touch in a long time. Because he wanted to reconnect with the Dharma, I think. So he, we talked, and and, uh, and we talked about meditation on love, actually. But um, he uh, he reminded me of something I'd forgotten, which was that he and I we were religious studies majors and literature majors, and we would go around to different religious organs. You know, before I was Buddhist, so I I suggested this idea. We would go all over all over the place, to every like many many different religious traditions. We would just go to their temple, their church, their mosque there whatever <laughs> and ask them questions ask you know like try to learn we were religious studies majors we thought it'd be great to learn and he said that one question i would ask which makes me laugh it was insane i think but so i was going to like these little churches and little places and i, and I, I would as i would say william blake the great poet said everything is holy do you believe that and uh I said to him, what in the world? I said, now he said it, I remembered asking that. And I said, what did the like pastor in a small church say that? He said, I don't really remember, but we, I don't think we were thrilled by the answers necessarily. Um, it was a funny question to be asking, but it, it was, you know, uh, I guess um, that was part of my interest. And I, uh, the prayer world connects to that. That's why I'm mentioning it, is uh, a sense of the sacred imminent in the world. Um, I didn't know that when I first saw prayer wheels, but that's part of what the prayer wheel practice gets at, which is a Vajrayana uh, part of, connected to the Vajrayana tradition of Buddhism. But um, anyway, I think it was 1991, probably, I, I traveled in India and Nepal, and in Nepal, I kept seeing prayer wheels. If you go to Nepal, there are many prayer wheels there. And um, I, th I tell in the book, the first time I, I specifically remember a prayer wheel, I was in the monastery of a uh, great, great, late, he passed away, but a great, great master, uh, 
His Eminence Chob Gay Chichen Rupshe. He was a teacher of His Holiness Dalai Lama and of Lama Zubur He was there and he was teaching. And he had built a huge prayer wheel. And there was a father who was worried there were kids trying to spin the prayer wheel. And um, the father was worried. He was a Tibetan man. He was worried that the kids were going to get hurt. So he called me over and we started spinning the prayer wheel, helping the kids. And it was this humongous prayer wheel. It took up a whole room, uh, as some prayer wheels do. And uh, and so this Tibetan man and I and the children were all spinning the prayer wheel together, and he felt the kids were safer, and we were sort of, it was a very sweet moment. And I thought, oh wow, what is this? You know. <clears throat> and so um, I was at that point when I was at the monastery of Chogyi Chitrimshay. I was on my way up to Kopan Monastery, where um, my teacher who died last year, uh, Lama Zopa uh was going to be teaching for a month. It was a November course; he would teach month-long November courses. And so he taught beautifully, and um, and one day, uh, the opportunity to go up to his per personal room to meet with him, and I had a list of questions, as I often will when meeting with farmers, and um, I asked my questions, but at a certain point, he kind of suddenly started telling a story that was unrelated to anything I was asking about. I wasn't asking about prayer wheels, but he said that as a boy himself, growing up, he, you know, he was from the Sherpa region of Nepal, right? So he was, uh, people may have heard of Sherpas. They help, um, Sherpas are, I mean, are Tibetan Buddhists, the Nepali Tibetan Buddhists. They're known uh, in the U.S., I think, mostly because the, uh, they're from the Mount Everest region, Nepal. And so um, I think Tenzin Norgay was one uh, Sherpa who helped with, uh, climb, you know, famous first climb of Mount Everest and so on. Uh, Lama Zubrashe at that time, during that class, he said, it's very funny, he said, people are insane. He said, the Western people come and spend so much money, so much money to climb Mount Everest. And then he said, they don't realize, like, it's better to have an inner adventure. And, uh, it, you know, to, to sort of take an inner adventure into the nature of your own mind. He said, that's much more meaningful than climbing Mount Everest. But anyway, um, so he grew up in that region. And Lama Zorbashe once said to me, as a boy, he used to see people spinning prayer wheels all the time. And he thought, why are they doing that? What's the meaning? Like, what's, what's the benefit? Why do people do that? He was wondering in his own culture, like, why do people spin prayer wheels? And he said that um, he would ask sometimes, uh, looking for a text about it, but they were hard to find. Uh, it was hard to find texts about the practice of the prayer wheel in Tibetan, in, you know, that he was looking for. And then uh, there was a great yogi who I later who I met at Kopan named Geshe Lama Kunchuk. He was a, a scholar who became a great yogi, meditated for a long time in Milarepa's caves, and so on. And um, he said to Lama Zorbashe, "Oh, I, I read the text. It's by the fourth Panchen Lama. There's one great text." And he said, "You should read it," but he didn't have it. So Lama Zorbashe then Geshe Lama Kunchuk said, "Oh, there's a Geshe, and I think he was in um, Australia." And he said. If you meet him, he'll have that text and you can read it. So, then, so I'm sitting in Lama Zorbashe's room and he's telling me this long story about his travels and trying to find out about the benefit of prayer wheels. And he says, so finally he went to, he went to um, from, you know, he was from Nepal, but he went to Australia to teach. And he called up this Geshe who had the uh, text. And he said, I want to see it. And so he said, um, so then he, he and the Geshe met and the Geshe brought him this text on the prayer wheel benefits by, um, uh, by one of the pension lamas. And um, Lama Zopashi said he read the text and he was so overwhelmed by the benefits. He felt so inspired, so overwhelmed that he said to me, he took the text and he put it atop his head, as Tibetans will do out of respect, right, for something. But, and he made a vow, he said. He said, I made a vow to Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of compassion, uh, from whom the prayer will kind of comes. He said, I made a vow that I would spread, I would help spread the practice everywhere. And so... Um, I thought, wow, that was an amazing story. I didn't know why he had told me it. But um, the next day, it must have been, my sister was there. At, uh, she was an exchange student, like in college. I told her that story, and she um, was very sweet. And she went and bought me a little a tiny handheld prayer wheel. And so I was walking around Kopan Monastery with it, and I didn't quite know how to turn it. And so I was, like, turning it poorly. And suddenly, Lama Zobrashe appeared. And walked up to me and started gently showing me how to turn a prayer wheel properly, um, which is like uh, smoothly uh, like that, not too fast, not too slow. And so um, 
he was showing me that and then he retold the entire story almost in the same words uh kind of started at the very beginning when i was a boy in nepal and told the whole story of his vow and as he finished tell, describing his vow i became overwhelmed with something <laughs> i don't know and uh i was i think i always find this part funny i was staying there with my then uh, person i was dating at the time uh and i said um I said, well, we'll help fulfill your vow. Uh, I said, I vow to help fulfill your vow. And so um, then I thought, oh, my God, what am I saying? I don't know how to do that, of course. But uh, but I said it, and so I, and I meant it. Um, I'm not sure it was appropriate. To, I, I laugh about it because I'm not sure it was, <laughs> it was a bit inappropriate that I included that other person in my vow. <laughs> so really not supposed to do that, but anyway. Um So that was how I got involved with parables, my point. And um, part of the point I was sharing with is like, uh, you know, so it's a practice that's very ubiquitous throughout the Central Asian, you know, throughout Central Asia, Tibet, uh, in Nepal, in Northern India, and then also in other, you know, in um, Bhutan. So, uh, there are parables also in Mongolia. I've seen pictures. I've not been there, but I've seen photos of them. So, um, and so then uh, Lama Zoprashi sent me his translation of that text. And uh, I started, I, I've actually, I went to a local Buddhist center and there was a friend, a guy named Buddha Palada. And uh, he and I started making wooden prayer wheels, very kind of not very, not, sort of, not, they weren't quite beautiful looking, I guess. Yeah, the artist, you know, they were wonderful prayer wheels, but in the sense of the meaning, but the artistry, I wasn't, I'm a good woodworker or anything like that. So, um, but then we started, I just started giving, making them and giving them away. I gave, and I gave one to Lama Zopramche and, um, he said he gave it to the King of Nepal. Uh, so the King of Nepal had a, we made and, and, um, I gave one to his holiness. Actually, I, yeah, anyway, I won't tell the whole story, but I made one and, gave, and got, uh, got to offer it to his holiness Dalai Lama. So we made various parables. And, um, I started collecting different commentaries about the prayer wheel in Tibetan. Uh, Lama Zorbashi had said it was hard to find them, but eventually I was able to locate a number of them. And so um, various friends, uh, people translated them. And so that's how then I decided, oh, well, that'd be, you know, one way to help fulfill my commitment is to put out a book that, so people can understand about prayer wheels. And then also by offering them uh, to people, then that was sort of my beginning attempt. Um, and then I think the book helped a bit because then uh, other people got interested. And um, I don't know if any of you know Paula Chichester. She was to uh, she's a yogini. She did many years of retreat. Um, but I offered one to her, and her stepfather, who was I thought this a beautiful story. Actually, he was a Christian retired Christian minister, and he she showed him the prayer wheel uh, that I offered her and the book, and. He who had been a, had spent his career as a Christian minister was also had his hobby that he sort of spent his time on in retirement was wood turning, you know, uh, where you put a wood on a lathe and turn it. And so he innovated a new thing, which was uh, he started making prayer wheels like out of uh, turned wood. And this is one I'm sure I'm gonna, part of my presentation today. So I'll show prayer wheels. Uh, this is one that he made, which is out of a uh, purple heart wood. He would make them out of very beautiful kinds of wood. And uh, filled them in the traditional way, but he would, he, it was a new innovation, wood turned prayer wheels. And he did that for many years until he died. And then uh, that became a tradition around the world. So now there, there are other kinds, there are metal prayer wheels, which I'll share, and um, various kinds of prayer wheels. But he innovated, that was the first, I think, cross cultural aspect to it. If that, and that's why I'm sharing about it, is Tibetan, you know, and in, in Central Asian culture, I've not seen wood turned prayer wheels. But, um, he began a new thing, which is these, you know, sort of beautifully carved or beautifully turned uh, wooden prayer wheels. Um, so uh, anyway, that's just like a, <clears throat> um, I'll come back to my own story. But I want to sort of say, just share that was how I became a sort of got interested in prayer wheels. It was this, through this experience with Lama Zopra. <clears throat> but then, um, so what is a prayer wheel, though? I you know, don't really explain that yet. And first thing I'll say is this term prayer wheel, um, it's funny, 
it's used and I use it, but it's actually the Tibetan term usually is uh, mani kordo, so like mani wheel, right? which mani can mean jewel, but also mani is a reference to the Om Mani Pei Hum mantra. Right? <clears throat> so, um, and it's actually, it's, you know, actually to answer the question, what is a prayer wheel is a bit difficult, isn't it? Like, um, <clears throat> so I'll, I think I'm going to answer on different levels, if that's okay, because uh, Lama Zobar, I'll say it this way. First of all, Lama Zobar Mishay would say a prayer wheel is a manifestation of the speech of the Buddha. That it's and, and if it's a mani wheel, then it's the mana, it's a manifestation of Avalokit, the compassion Buddha's holy speech. That's the way Lama Zobar Mishay would put it. Um, and then he actually, and he he said once, he said, so a manif it's a manifestation of the of Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of Compassion's holy speech. And if you engage with that prayer will, you yourself will achieve the holy speech of a Buddha as well as the holy body and mind of a Buddha. So that's, that would be his answer. You know. um, I'll start though with a more mundane point, which is a prayer will is a, um, I mean, I'll start with kind of a mundane yeah, reflection or work, which is a prayer is a physical object, first of all, right? It's um, a physical thing. And it um, it usually can, uh, is made with a cylinder, right? And this becomes important, actually. So on the bottom, inside the cylinder at the bottom is something called an earth wheel. And I'll actually show you a Oops, I can find it quickly. There's a diagram. There we go. Yeah. So this, when I say earth wheel, it's actually like a, a mandala of mantras. That was uh, that was written by, this is a, it's described in the text and Lama Zopar Mbache wrote that out, uh, created that. Um, so you put that at the bottom of the cylinder, right? Facing up. And then at the top, is a sky wheel, and that's the sky wheel, which has other mantras that are facing down. And in the center is the central pole or shaft, the life tree, they call it in the tradition, of the prayer wheel, right? That's going to hold the prayer, that holds the wheel together. And that has um, other uh, mantras on it to bless that life tree. And then... Um, and then here's a, yeah, so here's a diagram of that, actually. First, you can see there, there's the cylinder that's not, doesn't have an outer core yet. And there's the earth wheel and the sky wheel and where they go. And then one winds mantras onto the life tree. So there's a diagram of winding mantras onto the life tree. Um, so first, there are these, um, first, you, you would wind on these life tree blessing mantras, you call them, or, yeah. And then, um, and then you wind on, depending on time and inclination, hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of mantras. Um, and some prayer wheels have very, traditionally there have been mostly, the most prayer wheels are made with mani mantras, the mantra of the Buddha of compassion, om mani pe me hum. <clears throat> and then um, there are prayer wheels though of other, with other mantras in them, the medicine Buddha or Tara or Vajrasattva or uh, many other ones. Um, Nowadays, they're made with all different mantras, <clears throat> you know, with me included. And then um, sometimes Buddhist texts are also placed within them. Um, in East Asia, there's actually a tradition of um, uh, revolving libraries, where they actually would put, like, the whole um, Buddhist scriptures on a library that spins. Um, <clears throat> but um, in the Tibetan tradition, it's mostly uh, mantras, but they sometimes put texts in as well. <clears throat> and... Um, and then on the outer, and then outside of the, once you've filled the cylinder, it's decorated. And I'll show you in a few minutes some pictures of beautiful sort of large prayer wheels that are decorated. Um, so that's how a prayer wheel is made, you know, sort of structurally. Um, and if you travel you know, in um, in that region, you'll often see, like, you'll see large prayer wheels, like I described, right, where people can go around and turn them, and they're quite big. 
you'll also sometimes often see um just people hanging out uh you know um spinning uh perials and um in the book i'll just share there's a couple of pictures of tibetans turning prayer wheels and um here's one of a man spinning a, a row of and, and prayer wheels in a row as they often appear and i can share one more picture for the book and then i'll stop but there's a lot of she's spinning one of those uh wood turned prayer wheels um <clears throat> so why do people do that um like what's you know but that was Lama Zoprashi's question right what's the meaning of that practice what's the benefit and um you know the point you know in, in um in my experience maybe other people but in my experience in the um in the U.S. and in Europe or Australia too well in the U.S. and Europe I guess I'll say uh I think the two Lamas who have been most prominent in sharing and spreading the practice of the prayer well have been um Lama Zorbamshe, who, who I think did it, as I mentioned, quite early on. And then also um, a very big proponent of the prayer well practice who's popularized it in the West um, is Garchen Rinpoche, his eminence Garchen Rinpoche, um, who also is, if you see him, he's almost always spinning a prayer well. Even as he teaches, he's almost always spinning a prayer well. And many of his students do the practice. Uh, other Lamas like um, Tarthang Tuku, also of Nyingma tradition, also has, I, I don't see the handheld, but it, he's, built uh, larger prayer wheels in some of his centers and other places. Actually, at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. is a prayer wheel that he donated, that he made uh, and donated to the Library of Congress. So he certainly has also been a proponent of the prayer wheel practices. And he translated a little tidy booklet uh, early on about prayer wheels, or his group did. <clears throat> um, so those are some of the people who popularized the practice. Um, So now I think I'll do, I'm going to, okay, so <clears throat> that's just, so I'm just sort of, that, so far I've done like an outer, right, my own little bit, how I met, came across the practice and um, and how they're built. But now I want to jump <clears throat> to something different, which is, and I, and I actually want to jump straight there, which is the benefits of the practice. Because, you know, so why did, why do people practice it? And we'll get to it and if, after I explain the benefits. I'll go over like the meditation, how one meditates on the prayer wheel, the actual meditation you do. But but I want to say something about the benefits part because um, I don't know. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how familiar people are, but um, you know, this first of all. Uh, Prayer wheels are connected. If you look at the sources of them, the sources of all the quotes, they're mostly uh, tantric texts of Vajra, ma secret mantra, right? So uh, texts of the secret mantra tradition. The secret mantra tradition or the tantric tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, of Indo, of, it's not just Tibetan, but of Indo-Tibetan Buddhism, of Central Asian Buddhism, and South Asian Buddhism, is, is um, I shouldn't just limit it to that though, actually, because uh, tantric tradition also spread to Vietnam at times and other places. But anyway, it's, it's a it's bigger than that, of course, but uh, I mean, spread more places. But um, so the prayer wheel practice is a Mahayana Buddhist practice that's also connected to the uh, Tantric or Vajrayana tradition. <clears throat> and um, now I'm going to speak from before I read these quotes, I want to speak for a moment about the cross cultural thing. Uh, if you read Mahayana scriptures and, and then uh, yeah, I guess any of the Mahayana scriptures. If you actually read like the sutras, um, I think if you you know if you're from um, Europe or the U.S., it's an unfamiliar kind of literature to say that first of all. And I actually think people don't sometimes maybe don't pause to reflect on that. But if you read the various sutras, they're a I mean, books of literature in that sense um, of what inconceivable unimaginable positivity uh, and uh, 
I've often reflected on this. I'm just going to share a personal reflection, which is, you know, the literature of, I don't like the term the West. I actually think it's a odd term. So I was about to say the literature of the West, but I think the West is an odd term because <laughs> it actually implies that it implies that the center is Europe, isn't it? You know, because uh, I mean, the, the West is an idea from of people who say the East, right? As if, first of all, as if the East is a monolithic thing, which it's not. Um, and as if the East is East, whereas if you're in, say, California, then it doesn't quite make sense, does it? The East would be New York or something. Um, so it's a sort of odd term, in my opinion. But uh, but I'll say Europe and America. And and uh, actually, you know, from Greece, right? Like, I was in Aristotle said literature should have, the story should have a conflict, right? And that the story should be sort of a conflict and the resolution of a conflict, which if you watch movies, if you read books, that's what, that's what, that's actually, that's what that literature is mostly, isn't it? Um, and I often think this, like if you, actually, if you like read a work written from, I guess I'll say from the culture I grew up in, if there's something positive in it, it's supposed to, mostly it's supposed to be sort of, what's the word, after a whole bunch of conflict, like, like there, if you actually, you know, you might have like a story where people are fighting and they're disagreeing and they hate each other. And then and there's a moment of forgiveness and you say, oh, how that was heartwarming. Um, you know, that's the moment of positivity is that there's one moment of forgiveness. If you read Mahayana literature, it's stories of, um, you know, of inconceivable positivity over eons. Right? That's the stories of bodhisattvas. You know, so you have stories of bodhisattvas who are going eon after eon and traveling throughout the universe, benefiting beings and achieving higher and higher levels of realization. So this, the, the, I say all of that just as an introduction. So these quotes are from that tradition. Um, so here I'll start. So Amitabha, the Buddha of infinite light said, in order to benefit beings of the degenerate age, the benefits of the six syllables are explained here. Anyone who recites the six syllables, that's the six syllable mantra of the, of the Buddha of compassion, Om Mani Padme Hum. So <clears throat> anyone who recites the six syllables while at the same time turning the Dharma wheel, the prayer wheel, here it's called the Dharma wheel, is equal in fortune to the thousand Buddhas. <clears throat> and Lama Zorbache addresses, he, in his commentary, he addresses this. That's, that's actually from the pension, one of the pension Lamas. He quotes that text from a tantric text. So I want to ask you, first of all, like this is what I'm getting about inconceivable positivity, right? Sometimes people actually, you know, <laughs> who was it? Pope, Pope John, Pope John Paul, previous Pope, right? He used to say, oh, Buddhism is very much a downer. It talks about only suffering. He never read this text, obviously, which is a traditional Buddhist text. Right. So this book, but this text is saying, like, that if you spin a prayer wheel once, right? If you say, if you yourself go to a Buddhist center, you know, which there is, there are all are, now that you can find prayer wheels quite here, you can order one. I'm sure. I, the, I shared links in the chat for two places. You can order your own prayer wheel. So it's not hard to get one. Right. And this is saying, if you yourself say, Om Mani Pei Me Hum, Om Mani Pei Me Hum, Om Mani Pei Me Hum, and you spin a prayer wheel, then um, you are equal in fortune to the thousand Buddhas, right? So Shakyamuni Buddha is the fourth of the thousand Buddhas. The next one will be Maitreya, then he'll be the fifth. There are going to be a thousand Buddhas of this eon. I think at DNKL, you guys do the thousand Buddha offering practice, right? We read the names of the thousand Buddhas of our eon. This is saying, Amitabha Buddha, this is according to this text, said, if you spin the prayer wall or reciting the Omani Pemihun, you're equal in fortune to the thousand Buddhas. That's you, right? So you have to, so think about that, right? What does that mean? We're going to come back to it. Um, then I'll give other quotes here. This is uh, from Shakyamuni Buddha. It says, for a sublime practitioner of the, of the heart meaning of this practice, turning the prayer once is better than having done a retreat for a year. For a middling practitioner, the heart meaning of turning this prayer wheel, Dharma wheel, is better than having a retreat for seven years. Even for the lowest practitioner, turning the prayer wheel, the Dharma wheel, once is better than having done a retreat for nine years. Turning the Dharma wheel is better than listening, reflecting, or meditating for eons. Uh, so that's a quote from Shakyamuni Buddha. 
Um, and then uh, the person he was speaking to says, asks a question, says, uh, turning the Dharma wheel once is better than attempting to practice the 10 transcendent par par uh, paramitas, perfections, for a thousand years. It is even better than listening to the three baskets and the four tantras for eons. Um, and then uh, I'm going to skip a little, but... Um, and then it says, turning the prayer will protect one from contagious diseases and epidemics. It stops one from choosing bad directions. In brief, it uh, it purifies your karma. And then it says, um, the practice purifies the five uninterrupted negative karmas and the ten non-virtuous actions. It purifies all even evil gone actions, which would be cause rebirth in the lower realms. By turning the prayer wheel, one will be reborn in the pure realm of a Buddha. One will enter and take birth in the lotus heart on a lion throne in the blissful realm of Sukhavati, which is the uh, pure land of Amitabha Buddha. One will develop the actions of the Buddhas in the ten directions. Um, and then uh, Avalokiteshvara said, this great wheel of the mantra excels all other wheels. If the fortunate migratory beings who rely on this Dharma wheel by turning it and make a request, will find the best refuge and protector in this and future lives. So um, I want to read some of those quotes to say, so that like the traditional Tibetan commentary that Lama Zobrashe read had, that, that's that's actually quoting that, that's from that commentary. So it's it gives these, um, what's the word? Uh, inconceivable, I guess I'll say, or inconceivable benefits. Um, and so I want to pause and ask, like, just to reflect together, like, how do you, you know, how does one, how can one relate to that, right? Like, and, uh, it's describing, right? The first one describes how Amitabha says, right, that the Buddha manifest, that's what Lama Zopashe, I was going back to Lama Zopashe's view, right? The prayer will is a manifestation of the Buddha's holy speech, right? So it's saying a prayer that the, um, the Buddha, this is the traditional perspective, right? That the Buddha, in this case, Avalokiteshvara, decides to benefit beings, he's going to create a speech manifestation, right? So he created the lineage of the prayer wheel. Um, and uh, transmitted it to the human realm, you know. Uh, and then um, it's been passed down for centuries and so on. Um, And I'll say a few, I'm going to go through a few more points, actually. I'll keep going, and then I'll come back and, explain, and say more. I'll say what Lama said about it, and I'll share my own reflections a bit. But um, <clears throat> the commentaries go on to explain that anything that turns a prayer will becomes blessed by the power of the mantra. So it says um, that if you spin a prayer will, as I'm doing now, then your body, uh, because it's turning the prayer will, what's the word, sort of, gets infused with that energy. And then anyone you touch, anyone who sees you, anyone who has contact with you benefits. And then it says there are prayer wheels turned by um, the elements. And that's where, let me see if I can quickly share. Um, so screen share. I'm just gonna share some more images. If I can find it, here we go. Is that working? Can people see? Yes, we can okay. see it. Okay, great. So, um, so these are first of all, that's like a large. You know, I, I mentioned there are large prayer wheels, like in in the center of communities, right? So there are some examples. Oh, those are some medium size, but there's large ones. Um, and then let's see. Letting me, I want to jump to a different, oh, there. Uh, here, oh, there's one here I want to share. So these are what, wheels turned by water. Um, so you can see like the, uh, like a stream will turn the prayer wheel inside. And it's got, you know, like a, like a mill, but it's not producing any grain. It's just to turn a prayer wheel, right? So those are uh, water wheels. 
there throughout uh, those are probably in Tibet and Nepal. Then here are some wind wheels. So, huh. These are traditional wind wheels spun by the wind. And then I'll just share this one, row of prayer, rows of prayer wheels in the community so that people can turn them. Okay, I'll stop sharing. So um, in the commentary, why do they create those, right? So the idea is this, is that uh, whatever element, uh, you know, according to this, the commentaries, whatever element turns the prayer wheel right, it becomes blessed. And so... Um, The idea, if you start to see it, then and and um and as you spin a prayer wheel, by the way, I'm not going to get into the details, but you imagine uh, energy from the mantra is going out to all beings. So you imagine like light rays or energy going out, blessing your own body, blessing the environment, blessing the water, blessing all sentient beings, and we'll go into detail about that. So you imagine the world as um. I, that's why this is by the way this is why I started with that strange story about asking the Blake quote right. Uh, the Blake had said, everything is holy, you know, and do you believe that? Uh, you know, in from the, um, if you look at the Buddhist uh, traditions, right, if you look from, uh, it's kind of funny, isn't it? If you look from the perspective of the um, vehicle of individual liberation, right, the original teaching of the Buddha, uh, when he first achieved enlightenment, when he taught in the Four Noble Truths, then he said, you know, samsara is qualified by suffering, right, that life includes suffering. Uh, which is obviously true. Um, here in the Vajrayana tradition, at the same time, one well, doesn't deny that, that there is suffering, right? But one looks, uh, one sees one's own body and the world as uh, arising, right, from a transcendental wisdom of, you know, um, uh understanding the ultimate nature of reality and then uh and sacred as mandala um the tibetan and, and so this i'm sorry so the practice of the mani wheel in a way bridges those you know because you're imagining these light rays going out you're imagining the world becoming sacred your body becoming sacred the water the wind the air and so on becoming uh sacred and blessed by the mantra And I, now, um, and and uh, well, now I want to say so. So, what what's the effect of that? Right? How does that impact? And I wanted to just share some personal reflections. Like, because the point of the prayer will practice is compassion, right? Is developing love and compassion, um, and progressing on the path to enlightenment and purifying your negative karma, actually. Um, I'm hesitating, but I think I'm going to go off on a tangent here for a moment, uh, if that's okay. Uh, but um, actually, I'll share a couple different points. Like one is, uh, I remember, well, I lived in outside of DC in, nor in Northern Virginia, and um, I remember one day I was at a Buddhist temple, and I was, I, I, went, I was, and uh, Oh, actually, the uh, the uh, the relics were there. The Buddha's relics and the um, a giant statue uh, made of jade of the Shakyamuni Buddha was there, and there were all these um, families there, you know, sort of praying and meditating and teaching their children to prostrate. It was very sweet. And I was sitting there looking at everybody, and I realized it, this was the same land where the civil war had been fought. And I was watching the people, and I thought, wow, like so, there were people at one point on this land killing each other. And today there are people here filled with devotion and love. And it really struck me like, wow, this is a holy, this is like, it's like a pure land today. But there was a time when the same land, right, if you call it the same land, was like hell. Um, and uh, I'm going to keep going in that direction. <laughs> um I'm going to share this, actually. This is another, uh, I call it a peace wheel. Um, 
And actually here, this is the base. It says peace. And then um, in Hebrew, it says shalom. And in Arabic, it says um, uh, salam. Uh, it was made by a friend of mine in Israel uh, during the war. I asked them to make it for me. And she, 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 but uh, the wife is a couple, and the wife gave this to me. Uh, she made the base as a gift. Um, and but I, uh, I'll share like, what is that? So what is salam and shalom? first of all, it's odd if you look at the salam and shalom, the Hebrew and the Arabic, they're quite similar scripts. Uh, and so, um, given what's happening in Israel, and uh, sometimes they translate those words salam and shalom is peace uh, but they actually i think uh, etymologically they mean oneness right with the recognition that if you recognize your oneness with others then there will be peace and this is a prayer was they made uh that um is like a globe you can see the continents are there there's africa asia australia <laughs> the americas uh, but this, this I call it a peace wheel, um, because this one has inside of it, um, I shall read it to you, uh, 10 million Omani Pemehongs, 160,000 White Tara Mantras, 40,000 Vajrasattva Mantras. But then it also includes uh, the Sarat El Fati, El Fatiha, or prayer from the Muslim tradition, the Shir. Lamalot prayer from the Jewish tradition, the Lord's Prayer in Coptic, I think it is, from the Christian tradition, the Baha'i Prayer for Unity, the Hopi Prayer for Peace, and Gartan Rinpoche's Prayer for Peace. Um, and I, um, I've been communicating with those friends of mine who make wood turn prayer wheels in Israel throughout the war, and they've been continuing to try to make peace wheels that are interfaith. Um, so, and the reason why I'm saying all that is, um, so what's the meaning of seeing a place as holy, right? Actually, I think it's ironic if you, in, the, in the play, you know, um, and what I'm suggesting is, um, you know, on the one hand, a prayer will can just seem like a, I don't know, a religious or some kind of cultural expression but um i'm just sharing my own view now i guess on this topic which is it's an incredibly profound practice actually right and uh if you see your place as holy it's oh by the way it says if you have a prayer well in your home your home is the same as avalokiteshvara's pure land right which is in one way you know, which is an interesting thing to think about, right? How, that assertion. And what I want to suggest to you is this, is how does that affect you? This is why I'm trying to get it now, the practice, right? So if you spin a prayer wheel and you, and I'll share my own reflection, for example, like um, it says it says in there, if you say, if you recite the Om Mani Pemi uh 10,000 times a day while spinning prayer wheel, or even if you're not spinning prayer wheel, then any water your body touches, any air your body touches, any person your body touches is blessed and will not go to lower realm and so on. Um, and uh, so if you do that practice, right, I'll, I'll share my own reflection in this sense. Like if I go in the pool or the ocean um, and then I think, oh, wow, like all these people around me, you know, my being here is to touch the water and we're together in this water, right? And may it bless them. You go in the ocean and you think I'm with, there with all the fish, right? And may my presence be a blessing for them, right? May my, may my presence bring them peace. Uh, And how do you usually view yourself? That's what I'm getting at here, right? How do you usually view yourself? Right? And then how do you view yourself if you imagine yourself as blessed by the speech of the Buddha of Compassion, Avalokiteshvara? 
you know, if you if you were late to your home, you know, it was by the according to the commentary, my home is the pure land of Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of compassion. Um, and I guess I'm going back to my point. That's why I gave the example of like a place of war and a place of peace, right? Actually, it's up to what that's getting at is it's in your control, right? Your home. Actually, you can make your home hellish. Or you can make your home like a pure land. And the prayer will practice, in my opinion, is a reminder of that. That you can make your home, your community, your town, your country, your planet, your universe, a place of conflict and hatred or a place of love and compassion. You can make them a place of horror and profanity or a place of beauty and limitless sacredness and the prayer will is a physical invitation to that awareness um and actually if you take like initiation and teachings in the vajrayana tradition then you know you say well you don't need a prayer will to know that <laughs> um but a prayer will helps uh, us to enter into that. And it helps others to enter into that, right, is the idea. Um, so I'm just, I'm so pausing because it's like, it's a radical idea, isn't it? And so I just, I just want to pause and think about that. Like, so what the prayer will practice is suggesting is, you know, we, we could think, oh, a pure land is someplace else, right? I was actually that Lama Geshe Lama Kunchok, who I mentioned, who Lama Zopramshe learned about the prayer will benefits from. Uh, Lama Zopramshe, we I he used to be walking. He was at Kopan. He would be walking around, and and Lama Zopra Lama Zopra Rinpoche said, he's living in Vajrayogini's pure land now, you know. And so you would look at him, and he would look like an old Tibetan man, and you would say, oh wow, okay. So he's perceiving the world differently than I am. The prayer will practice is an invitation. Um, to you, to me, to all of us, to relate to ourselves and the world in a different way, um, in a radically different way. And uh, here's some more reflections, then I'll go back, and then I'm going to explain the, the actual practice, which I haven't gotten to yet. Um, but I was having fun the other day, I was thinking about giving this talk, and I was like, one of the things that I actually, you know, I've done now the prayer will practice ever since the early 90s and enjoyed it. It's been a source of great fun and joy, like working with other people, like my friends in California and Israel who make prayer wills and so on. It's been a source of amazing enjoyment and fun. Uh, and it's also been uh, a profound Dharma practice. And so I want to share a couple of reflections that I find fun. Um, because one thing that, I don't, this is my own reflection, not from the traditional commentaries, but I want to say one of the things that I find most delightful about prayer wills is that, and I'm going to say this, you know, it sounds strange, but is that they're useless. And what I mean by useless is, you know, the Buddhist teaching on the eight worldly concerns, like, you know, is you don't make money, you don't get status. I remember once I used to walk around, and now I work as a psychologist, in Northern, and I'm in Northern Virginia, so I'm careful here. Uh, it's Virginia. But um, when I used to live in California, I used to walk around with a prayer wheel. And, uh, and people would say, what are you doing? You know, and I would say, well, I'm praying for you, uh, for your happiness. And they would look at me, whatever, you know. Um, in Virginia, I'm sometimes afraid someone might shoot me, so I'm a little careful. But in California, I wasn't afraid of that in Santa Barbara. <laughs> so I used to do that. But, um, you know, and so first of all, like, one of, the, one of the most delightful things about spinning a parallel is, and also if you're spinning a parallel, it's taking your hand, right? So you can't do other things that are for this life. Like, and, um, all of our stress, actually, you know, the eight worldly concerns, right? Being concerned with status, with wealth, with power, with pleasure, with, one of the Buddhist teachings is that's exhausting and stressful. Right? It exhausts our life, it keeps us distracted, and we never get to 
the inner work that actually matters. So one of the wonderful things about spinning apparel is if you're gonna do if you're gonna spin apparel, you're kind of you can't really do anything else. So you have to let go of doing. And I was reflecting on that. It was making me laugh because I was thinking in our culture, in my culture that I grew up in, there was the word that you know, actually like an insult would be uh you're spinning your wheels, right? If you were at a if you were at a business meeting and somebody says, We're spinning our wheels is a waste of time. Or they would say, um, we're just going around in circles here. And uh, I started laughing because I was like, well, actually, if you're a Buddhist practitioner, you try to go around in circles, right? There's the practice of circumambulating holy objects. Um, and there's the practice of spinning prayer wheels. <laughs> so, you know, I'm getting at a cultural difference here, though, right? Um, so my point is one relief in spinning, and one wonderful thing about spinning a prayer wheel is... Um, you know, in a world, in a, actually in a capitalist culture, you're not uh, you're not doing anything that brings a profit, uh, and that's and and, uh, and what Lama Zoprashu would actually say is the prayer practice brings the deepest profit. Therefore, it brings the deepest kind of profit, uh, which is enlightenment, um, but it's a different kind, you know, um, different kind of thing. Uh, so by spinning the prayer wheel, one point is it's not for your status. It's not for your wealth. It's not for your pleasure. It's not for your, it's for, or it's for an inner kind of pleasure, uh, but not for sort of distracting pleasure. Um, and so what does one do actually? So when you, usually when you spin a prayer wheel, you would start by generating compassion and bodhicitta and then actually i'll just go through the actual traditional practice so first you you um you imagine for coming from the light you know that uh the mantras are inside the prayer wheel and you imagine uh first that those light rays strike your own body and um i'm spinning the prayer wheel, so if you have one you can spin it if not you can imagine this though like I said, you actually imagine the prayer. So as you, so it starts, the prayer wheel is turning, the light rays come to your body and they draw out all sicknesses, all fatigue, all um, inner predispositions towards sickness, uh, all your negative actions of body, your negative karmic tendencies of body. Um, <clears throat> anything about your body that causes you discomfort or pain. And the prayer will draws them out, draws them into itself, and they dissolve there. And the light rays continue to strike you. And they draw out all your other negative karmic tendencies. Right? Any negative karmas you have from countless previous lives or this life. Any bad habits, any tendencies that you don't like or traits you don't like about yourself. So all those tendencies, all those traits, all those karmas get drawn out and dissolve into the prayer world. <clears throat> Everything that's an obstacle to your enlightenment for the welfare of yourself and others gets drawn out of you by the light rays of the prayer wheel and uh, dissolves into the prayer wheel. And then the light rays in the prayer wheel still radiate to you and they fill you with love, with compassion, with equanimity and with joy. They fill you with uh, bodhicitta. The light rays reach you and they enhance and sort of, uh, yeah, they, yeah, you say enhance or, or give you uh, the heart of generosity. 
So which means joy. They, they give you a kind of compassionate love and joy in giving. <clears throat> they give you a natural inclination towards ethics, morality, based in compassion. Right? So they give you a kind of love and compassion that means you won't want to harm anybody, right? which is the ultimate ethics. They give you the kind of strong compassion and wisdom uh, that allow you to be patient. Patient with hardships, right? As you work on, you know, the hardships will come sometimes as you work on projects and things to help yourself and others. So they give you that kind of patience. Right? They give you also the patience of not uh, responding with anger to harm. And they give you the patience uh, that allows you to comprehend the Dharma. <clears throat> Then the light rays strike you also and give you um, uh, joyous effort, which means taking joy in efforts towards uh, the Dharma practice, joy in working for others. Right? Then they strike you and they give you um, Meditative concentration on the ultimate nature of reality. So concentration combined with um, wisdom of emptiness. <clears throat> and your body uh, becomes a body of light, like the body of you know, a mental body of the bodhisattva, just like with all the qualities of Tara or of Lokiteshvara. So you imagine yourself with all the now, like with a body of light and all the qualities of Avalokiteshvara or Tara, you know, the Buddhas of compassion. And then you usually go through now um, after after doing that for yourself, you can go in different orders, but for well, you can do first people, humans. So you can imagine the people, same thing happens, right? All the negativities, illnesses, you know, uh, people in your neighborhood, all the hatred, all the anger, all the fear. You know, so phys physical illnesses and pains and problems and also mental afflictions, right? So you imagine like all the hatred in the world, right? you know, in, in your own, in yourself, but I mean, in your, in your own neighborhood, in your country, and in other countries all over the world, and all the hatred, all the ignorance, all the greed, and so on, pride, arrogance. Jealousy. Yeah. They all rise up like a dark cloud and are drawn into the prayer wheel. And all those beings are freed from all those sufferings and causes of suffering. And so, you know, it's like you can think of people who are ill people who are in also in zones of conflict and war, <clears throat> people who, are, who have been caught up in anger and hatred. And all that negativity rises up, is drawn into very well. <clears throat> and then the light rays go out. And really try this now, to so imagine like, that all of those beings in this in your own country, you know, and in all those other places, parts of the world, experience love for each other, for themselves and each other, experience and everybody. 
experience compassion, joy, and a compassion and love qualified by equanimity, okay? equally for all beings. Notice how that feels in your body as you imagine that. <clears throat> You know, if you imagine like the divisiveness in different places, whether it's this country or other countries, the hatred they are actually absorbed. And then those beings actually feel a sense of equanimity, kindness, respect, love for each other. You feel that for each of them and they feel it for each other. And imagine that that's like, imagine that world and that you're in that world, <clears throat> that you're helping create that world, that you're sharing that world with all those beings. And notice how that feels. And then imagine that all those beings, right, um, actualize um, generosity, morality, patience, joyful, compassionate effort, concentration and wisdom. <clears throat> And that they become like just the same with bodies of light, like Avalokiteshvara or <clears throat> and, and as we do that, right? Check in your body, see how it feels. Check your emotions. But that's that happens for imagining that through the prayer will practice that happens for like the least powerful people and the most powerful people. It happens for people who previously were peaceful and loving and for people who are the least peaceful and loving people on the planet. Mm. <clears throat> Regardless, their negativities are absorbed as the prayer will and they receive the realizations of love and compassion, bodhicitta, and enlightenment. <clears throat> And imagine that the world itself like, receives that, right? So the oceans, the mountains, the rivers. You can imagine them all like being blessed by the energy of the mantra of the prayer will. And the cities as well. The forests and the freeways equally become blessed. And you can imagine the same thing for all the animals. So the physical problems of animals, right? They sometimes they're being eaten alive even. Or they're sick, freezing, hot. And then the mental right there. And the fear, the ignorance, the anger of all the animals. <clears throat> Confusion. And so on, right? All the physical and mental problems of the animals that exist or absorbed into the prayer wheel.
and all those animals uh, first they're totally freed from all their negativities all their negative karma all their obstacles to enlightenment even the insects right spiders and so on totally freed from all ignorance all negative karma and then they receive through the light rays the realizations of limitless love limitless compassion limitless equanimity and limitless joy they actualize bodhicitta <clears throat> they achieve like again the six perfections generosity uh, ethics patience joyful effort equanimity i mean i'm sorry uh meditative equipoise or concentration and wisdom <clears throat> and they transform into bodies of light mental bodies uh, and achieve all the realizations and qualities of Avalokiteshvara or Tara <clears throat> and, um, I'll go quickly but I'll just say you could do now I do the same for like Beings in the hell realms, hungry ghost realms, also the demigod realms and the god realms. So when we go through all those realms, right? So imagine like all the suffering of hungry ghosts, and all the suffering of hell beings, and so on, being absorbed into the prayer wheel. Their fear, their hunger their craving, their anger, their hatred, their <clears throat> so on. Their physical and mental problems. <clears throat> and then the light rays go out. And help them actualize love, compassion, equanimity, Joy, bodhicitta, the six perfections, paramitas. And, and through that, they actualize state of enlightenment. Until you eventually imagine, like the, you know, uh, everywhere, right? Fill all beings fully enlightened all environments like a pure land and the places themselves like radiating with loving energy and peace and the beings you know totally uh, filled with compassion with love The kind of serene wisdom. And then again, notice how that feels. Right? As you imagine light rays going everywhere, all beings, you know, being freed from suffering and the causes of suffering, actualizing the qualities of enlightenment, all places, right? Again, whether they're forests or cities, whether they're, you know, uh, mountains or islands or every place filled with love with peace with kindness <clears throat> so and as you imagine that right, notice how that feels I just want to try something now. Not this is not the traditional, but actually, I want to try just for a moment. Notice how it feels to imagine like yourself and all beings, right? As we're doing, pervaded by light rays of the Buddha of compassion, actualizing all of that. And then, just for a moment, I just want to try just an experiment, which is like to go back and forth for a moment. 
So remember your normal way of perceiving things. Like after you see a news report or after you're on like social media or talking to a friend or whatever, going around. <clears throat> and just contrast from on how that feels, what that's like experientially for you. And then like going back to the world vision, to the self-perception and world perception of the prayer will practice, you know, and contrast them. Like, what's your self-perception and world perception if you, like, you know, if you're reading the news? And then what's your self-perception or world perception from the perspective of the prayer will practice? Just once or twice, go back and forth, right? So, like, you know, your normal way of perceiving and thinking and feeling, your normal worldview and self view. And then your view, your experience with the light rays of the Buddha of compassion pervading all beings, low and high, everyone achieving the state of the Buddha of compassion. I'm going to come back together. I want to pause there and see if anybody has comments or questions. I, I mean, there's plenty more I can say, but I, I just want to pause there and give people a chance um, to sort of either comments or questions if you want to about what's you know shared so far. Thank you so much. It's just so, so lovely. And thank you for teaching today. Oh, sure. Uh, Buchung put one question in the chat, if you can see it there. I was just pulling that up. Does the practice also involve visualizing yourselves as a logician? Uh, so, uh, first of all, Buchung, it's nice to see you. By the way, it's just the new year. Buchung's an old, good, good friend. Um, traditionally, there's like you, uh, the way it's taught, at least in the texts, um, you know, if you, if you already do like, uh, Avalokiteshvara sadhana or Avalokiteshvara practice, then of course you can, you do visualize yourself as Avalokiteshvara. But, um, but here the, I, I guess you I get your point though. In other words, rather than viewing the mantra, it actually it says this in the commentary. It's like, of course, when you're doing like your sadhana, you visualize like a mantra in your, um, in your in your various places of your body, but when you're doing the prayer wheel practice, you 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 imagine the mantra outside of you in the prayer wheel itself. Uh, so that's one difference. Um, and you can do them together, of course. You can spin the prayer wheel while you can do the prayer wheel practice while doing the sadhana, and, and you know, and then you do visualize it in your body. But um, but in the commentaries, what they mostly say is when you're doing the prayer wheel practice, your main focus is to um, visualize the light rays and so on coming from the wheel from the prayer will not from your body so you can you can combine them but the traditional commentaries just say you mostly visualize it coming from the prayer wheel itself from the outer wheel um so that's a that's a slight difference uh from yeah so you can combine again like the the i think the uh oral commentary from lama says you can combine them but if you're just doing the prayer wheel practice itself then you imagine it coming from the wheel um, I have a very basic question. Um, it's good to see you, Lauren. Good to see you. A long time. Um, so I believe it was Geshe Noam Kelsung that brought these um, prayer wheels to DNKL that are by the parking area down at the bottom near the house. Hmm. And so often, I'll just speak for myself, you know, I, I'll i I'll turn them as before I go in and, and I'm thinking, oh, money, pay me hung. But it seems to me after listening to you 
that it's really like the prayer wheels alone. Um, I don't know. It doesn't seem like the prayers, prayer wheels alone spinning would do all that it's doing without the sort of meditation that you've just taken us through or from what Lama Zopa Rinpoche was telling you or the other things, do the wheels turning without that kind of mindfulness and meditation still bring about such benefit? Yeah, so first of all, like, um, Lama, like uh, the way Lama Zopa taught it and the way the commentaries teach it, they say that, um, I mean, I guess a few things. One is uh, they do say just spinning a prayer wheel uh, and, and saying the mantra or just spinning the prayer wheel itself has that... Um, has a remarkable benefits. And so like, you know, like, so that's why I read that quote where it said, um, you know, so, and actually they say that, don't they? Actually in the commentary, oh, I didn't say this also. The commentary say like that, um, however many mantras are in the prayer wheel, that when you spin it, it going around once is, it creates the karmic, the same karma as if you said that many mantras. Um, and so, uh, of course, you know, if you, the more, what's there to say, right? You know, if you have compassionate motivation, that's better. If you have bodhicitta, that's better. If you do the meditation, that's very good, you know, better and so on. Um, so they would say like, and they, on the one hand, they say, you know, to the extent that you can um, meditate, of course, it brings more benefit. But they actually say that like, just as you, what I would recommend at least is, you know, if you can pause and meditate, great. But if, if you just like say the mantra and spin the prayer as you're going in and you just imagine say light rays going out, you know, and just think they're going out to all beings, um, that's still quite good. And they say the benefits still come. And part of, I guess, what they're getting at there, and again, it's a radical idea that's very uh, Mahayana Buddhist, is that... um. Is that you're connecting to Avalokiteshvara still, right? In other words, you actually think like so. Actually, and John, just try this for a moment. Like as you, I, you mentioned right there, the prayer wells at um, at DNKL. You know, and and on the one hand, like from a let's say from a worldly perspective, we would just say, oh, there's just objects that somebody brought from Nepal or Tibet or wherever they were brought from. But in this worldview, in the in the actual Tibetan Buddhist worldview, you would say those are Avalokiteshvara. So like Avalokiteshvara's speech is there at DNKL. You know, and even when, you know, even when there aren't uh, teachers present, Avalokiteshvara's speech is there. And each time you touch them, you're connecting, mm -hmm. you know, with Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of compassion. And just when you spin it, like, your body is still getting blessed on the land. And that's the other point that Allah Mazoprashe makes when he talks about prayer wheels, is he says, just having prayer wheels at a place and people spinning them, the land itself gets blessed. And then the animals on that land uh, get blessed. And that place becomes a place of peace. And then like, so you would actually think, well, each time I'm spinning that, even if I'm not all, totally aware of it, I'm benefiting all, I'm benefiting my, you know, everyone who then sees or touches or thinks of or sees an image of, you know, like a picture or photograph of my body, Janet, yours are on, you know, your books or whatever, you know, whatever, like that, uh, and even your children, oh, it says even your children, because your children and your grandchildren, are, it says for uh, 12 generations, that it's in the commentary, it says this, that for generations after your children benefit, because your body gets blessed, and then um, their bodies are connected to your bodies genetically, or, you know, whatever, so um, mm -hmm. that they get blessings. So the idea is that Yes, in one way, if you do the meditation, it's better. It's more profound. But the commentaries actually say that, that you actually think just by my spinning it. So you can think back, Janet, to the times you've spun it without even thinking, particularly. Like maybe you're just walking in and you spun it. That you are benefiting your own children and grandchildren and your great, great, great grandchildren. Mm -hmm. You are benefiting everyone who ever comes to DNKL Center. They'll feel a little of that peaceful energy coming back from the land and back from the air and back from the place. And every, you know, there are millions and millions, of course, of insects on that land, and there are birds, and there are squirrels, and there are whatever, all these different animals, they're all getting benefit. And um, and in the future, you know, on and on, that place will increasingly become a place of peace for others, and it's partly because you spun the prayer wheel. So you actually think that way. So even if you don't do the visualization, it's, you think, 
that has that kind of benefit. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank and you. thank you. Oh, good. Hi. Hi, Lauren. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Oh, good to uh, see you. Thank you. Good to see you. No, thank you so much. Um, so this, uh, really benefited from this, this morning. I just uh, one short kind of story regarding this. I, a year ago, Samdong Rinpoche told me to do 300,000 money mandras recited. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I was experienced definite science and I was like, uh, what's going on? You know, like, uh, I, I, I can do better things, you know, is he trying to undermine my ability by telling me you just do recite mandras? So now I'm really inspired to do all the mandras, 300,000. <laughs> um, but uh, mm. I have one question regarding the mechanics of it, the, uh, the money wheel, because uh, when we recite mandra, you know, uh, through speech, the most important kind of instrument is wind, right? Mm. The kind of the wind, the internal wind is actually responsible for actually making those speech heard, right? And I was wondering, like, the, it's the same concept with regard to money wheel, fairy wheels, because when you when it's turning, the wind is sort of kind of activated, right? It's like the wind is like moved. And so in a very subtle way, that wind is then kind of residing the mantras and that kind of goes throughout the space. Uh, I've heard it, I don't know, have you, have, uh, you know, have you read that in the text or have you, uh, you know, heard from just like very informal kind of um, setting. So is that the case? One point, um... It's interesting, like, uh, one point, like, uh, sometimes um, Garchen Rinpoche will make a number of points. Um, sometimes when he explains about prayer rules, uh, he doesn't really say wind, but he'll sort of say, it's like, he'll, he gives, an, he really draws a parallel, which is, I think, clear, you know, between the prayer wheel and the heart of the deity. You know, because we visualize in the heart of the deity, of course, as you know, Bhutan, you know the the syllables of the mantra. Right. So, um, in that sense, the prayer will is like the heart of the deity, and um, but it's also you know it, it's the mantra, so it's the speech. So you actually do think in a way that I think the way you would think of it is that uh, you know, like you yourself, of course, like if you're if I'm saying Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, as I'm turning the prayer will, of course, I'm my speech is saying the mantra. But in some sense, I think you actually think that the that uh, Avalokiteshvara is, is, you know, that Avalokiteshvara is not limited. Like I can only say one at a time. <laughs> um, but you think actually that I think Avalokiteshvara is like simultaneously reciting, you know, billions. Of, so it is like that, I think. Then, but it's that it's Avalokiteshvara's speech, then, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. So I think that would be Thanks. correct. What you're saying. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, maybe I'll share a few more things too. So, um, yeah, I already hinted at this, but there have been some, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, so first of all, like, uh, you know, the traditional practice of prayer wheels in, uh, Central Asian culture have been filled with mostly Mani mantras, um, uh, but also other mantras. Um, and then, uh, a number of innovations I'd wanted to share that are particularly like cross-cultural, so cross-cultural exchange. When I first started making prayer wheels myself, um, oh, I'll pause. I'll go ahead, uh, question first. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, but uh, okay. as a technical question, but since you know so much about it, um, I noticed the direction is always uh, clockwise in a lot of things in Buddhism, like circumambulations and obviously the prayer wheel. And then uh, Janice's question about uh, outside the gompa, as we're entering, we tend to, uh, if they're on our right side, we'll tend to do them in the correct direction. But quite often I've noticed people when they're exiting, find the prayer wheels on their left side and we'll, we'll rotate them counterclockwise. And so I'm just curious, what is the significance of the direction of 
uh, these rotations in circumambulations, in tantric practices, and in, in prayer wills, et cetera. Could you just uh, maybe talk a bit about that? Yeah. So first of all, like traditional, uh, a traditional prayer, like the ones at the end, Kelly, ideally you do spend them clockwise. If they're supposed to be clockwise. And um, actually in the, in the book, I shared a whole kind of history on this, like that, um, you know, clockwise is, uh, is clockwise because it's, it's connected to the sun actually, you know, and um, there's actually a connection, I think between, um, you know, the light that we're visualizing. I, this is my own view, I guess, but uh, you know, that we're visualizing the prayer wall as kind of radiating light. And it talks about choosing the right direction, not the wrong direction. So the idea is that um, in in uh, most, well, first of all, prayer walls are almost, or all the prayer walls I've ever known of are for clockwise turning. Uh, for circumambulations, it's usually clockwise, but occasionally, in, if you're practicing mother tantra, then you can go counterclockwise. Um, like in highest yoga tantra, there's a pr tradition of, uh, for somebody who practices mother tantra to do things counterclockwise. Um, but uh, but the prayer rolls are usually action tantra mantra, so usually you do them clockwise. Um, right. Oh, that's so interesting because in certain practices, you'll do all activities with the left, and in certain yeah. practices, you always present the right side. To yeah, the and it has person. to do with the sun, actually. You know, like, yeah, that's right. I thought it was whirlpools in north northern hemisphere, but it's actually the sun. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so it's it's connected. The, the symbolism is uh is connected. Actually, I, I I did some research and it's in the book, but um, there's some talk about in the Hindu tradition, uh, you know, the they there's actually a whole imagery around Surya, the god of the sun, and you know, traveling kind of, uh, and so the the whole clockwise is connected to the movement of the sun around the earth and and so on. Um, and then uh. And so it's, it's connected to like the idea of sunrise and, and whereas, you know, that's why you do also in the morning and the, for certain tantric practices and then um, mother tantras are more done at night. Um, so it's connected to that, actually. Oh, thanks very much. Um, but oh, and I was I was sharing. OK, so about the uh, innovations, I thought to share a little about that. So, um, you know, traditionally, of course, like in um, in Tibet, the mantras would either be usually woodblock prints or occasionally handwritten. Um, and so, you, you know, that, and then they would print many, many copies of the, usually the Mani mantra or whatever mantra, and then fill it with the, usually woodblock prints, but again, sometimes you could write out by hand. Um, and then, uh, when I was first getting involved with, uh, <laughs> prayer wills, Lama Zomberfe, um, was working with somebody, I think they were in Australia and they, they came up with the idea of, they went to Lama Zomberfe and, and I guess they were working together and there was an idea that, well, if you put it on microfilm. You could put more mantras in because the commentary says each time you spin the prayer wheel, um, you create the merit of having recited the number of mantras as they are in the prayer wheel. So they said, well, you can make so many more mantras if it's on microfilm. So then um, Lama Zobrashe quite was pleased with that idea. And then um, later, Garchan Rinpoche was also quite pleased with that idea. And um, so anyway, they, they started, to, there, there were various... So there are reels and reels. I have some at home here, but um, of microfilm, and they could fill the mantra. The so this prayer well, for example, um, oh, let's see, it says about the bottom here. Jim Glass was the one who made it, and it has thirteen million. So this little prayer well here, I spend this every day. Uh, the hand, hand carved. It has thirteen million mantras in it because it's filled with because they're on microfilm, um, and then. Uh, this prayer wall that I was turning earlier, I can't remember how many, it doesn't say, but it uh, has a few hundred million. I think, oh, I think I have it here, 800 million, uh, because they're on microfilm. So um, that was the that was like the first cross-cultural innovation, I think, was um, using microfilm to put more mantras in. And now it's become quite traditional. So now, uh, you know, when they're building, like at, at, when FPMT, for example, is building prayer wheels in Nepal, they're using microfilm. Uh, and bring it there. So um, the handheld ones and the large ones, and and uh, there's some at Land of Medicine Buddha that have many hundreds and you know, hundreds and a few billion mantras, I think, um, because they're filled with microfilm. Uh, then I think the next innovation cross culturally were parallels. If you can get this, just let me see them online. But um, solar powered, right? Because there are wind wheels and. Uh, there's a tradition of fire return wheels, which are, I show the picture of the wind wheels and of the water ones. Fire ones would be under, you can only turn a little bit, but it'll be under, oh, you can see it's starting to spin. Uh, fire ones would be under a candle, right? They would, or under, or on top of chimney, 
that could be, you know, the heat would, but this is served by solar power. So that was a new innovation. And so it's starting to spin because there's enough sun coming in the window that it's uh, turning. Uh, so that was the next innovation. Then um, the next innovation is connected to the one I started to share here. This one uh, that I said has the Mani mantras and the Tara mantras, but also, and Vajrasattva, but also prayers from the Jewish, the Muslim, the Christian, the Baha'i, and the Hopi traditions. And uh, these were created by, um, and th their link is in the, uh, th there was one of the links I share, the Holy Land prayer wheels, uh, Micha and Ayelet, who were uh, friends in Israel, who read, who met Garchin Ripshe, I guess, particularly, and then read the book also, and started making, they make uh, hand-turned wood prayer wheels. And their story, it was quite sweet, where they were making, you know, traditional Tibetan Buddhist prayer wheels, but they live, of course, in a country um, where there are a lot of different religious traditions. And um, so I think it was first a rabbi they knew said, well, I want a Jewish one. And they said, well, I don't know if we're allowed to do that. I don't know what prayer to put in. And so he, they asked him, and he said, well, uh, or her. I don't know if it was him or her. I think it was him. They also have a female rabbi there who they work with. But um, I think the original one was the male rabbi. And so he said, oh, use the Shir Lama. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Shir Lama Alat, uh, something like that, um, Jewish prayer. And they asked his permission. He said yes. And then they asked the permission. I mean, he asked for it, so he wanted it. But then I think they asked Garchin Ripache, and he said, oh, if it's done with compassion and with love, then that's great. So they started making um, Jewish prayer wells. And then they were good friends with a um, a local um, sheikh. And he said, well, I want a Muslim prayer well. And they said, well, we don't know what prayer. And then he said, use uh, the Surat al-Fatiha, which is the main prayer of Islam. And they said, well, we'll do it, but would you write it out by hand? So he wrote it by hand for them. And then they started making Muslim prayer wells. And then... Uh, I think a, a priest actually said, or so no, a friend asked for a Christian one. And they went to a priest and he said, um, he gave his permission and he said, but you should go to the place where Jesus gave the um, sermon. Uh, I think it was the, uh, of the, where he actually taught the Lord's prayer. And uh, yeah, the Lord's, so the place, because it's in Israel. So they went there and they asked somebody for the, to write it out in, I think it's, Aramaic or Coptic, I can't remember which, and they wrote it out, and then they had those made, and they made Christian ones. And then they had a Baha'i friend, and he came and he said, well, I want one that's Baha'i, but actually, Baha'i is, is interfaith, by it has an interfaith focus, so he said, I want one with all of them. And so then um, they went to Garchin and they said, what do you think of that? And he said, he not only gave his approval, he did, and then they started making these, which have all of them in it, including a Hopi prayer also. Um, but then uh, Garchin Rinpoche himself took all of it. He said, I want copies of all the prayers you're using. And he built a large prayer will at Garchin Institute in Arizona that has all those different prayers in it. Uh, that was an interfaith uh, prayer wheel um, for peace. And uh, actually, I'm not sure the status now. I was in contact with Mika and I, 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 I was sort of, I raised them the idea of building an interfaith, um, such an interfaith peace prayer wheel in Israel now during the war. And they were working on it. I'm not sure what the status is. They're trying to get that built, but I'm not sure because uh, of the war. It's been interfering, but um, but it was quite touching that when I when I raised it to them, they went actually. I just thought this was very sweet. They went actually to the rabbi and to the sheikh, and they said, "What do you think?" And both the rabbi, the Jewish rabbi, and the Muslim sheikh said, uh, "That's exactly what we need," you know, because people are divided. And we want to come together. Um, and really, my uh, I, that was my idea, because I think that's actually what the prayer was about, isn't it? It's a different vision of, you know, I hope eventually there'll be more interfaith prayer wills in the world, as well as traditional ones, because that's the vision of the prayer is one of peace, isn't it? And of people word, the, uh, not feeling divided, but feeling together, uh, feeling love for each other. And then uh, the most recent development, which I'll share, uh, was, uh, I guess, before Lama Zobramshe died, there was a student in, I think, Singapore who uh, told him about nanotechnology and said, we could put mantras, uh, what's the word? We could make mantras on nanotechnology and put them in the prayer. You could put even more. And so Lama Zobramshe was quite, was supportive of that idea, who this person, this person proposed it. 
And so um, this is a prayer well with nanotechnology, Omani Pemihungs in it. And this one has, remember the other one I said had the, like, um, I'll just contrast. This one has um, 800 million, whereas this one has 550 billion mantras because it's uh, nanotechnology. Uh, so you can put many more. So this one, and I was just sort of, I was entertained and intrigued by this. So this one has 550 billion Omani Pemihungs plus 100,000 medicine Buddha mantras and 1,004 Dhammakaya relic mantras in it um so this prayer will actually it's funny it's it's uh, humongous but uh it would have more mantras in it than you know one the size of a small building traditionally that was done with um paper because of the technology and um they just finished actually they're just now finishing at vajrapani institute in california one with, uh, made all made exclusively with the nanotechnology a huge one I should have put up pictures of it. My friend uh, John uh, Jackson is building it. and um, uh, But it's going to have the most mantras of any prayer I'll ever build. And he sort of, I was talking to him on the phone the other day and he said, he's a fun person. And uh, anyway, he was saying, um, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, that people will build, they're, they're already working on something that will have more mantras than that. But um, he was quite excited that you know, it's a new technology. Um, Point being, my point just being that, um, you know, it's a, prayer walls are part of a cross-cultural exchange now, you know, in the world. Um, and uh, it's an ongoing process. I'm hoping eventually to kind of, after I have more time, to kind of do a new edition of the book that adds some of that new information about new developments in the practice. Um, oh, and I was going to share one thing related to that. I, one day I, I went, got to talk with, because um, when I thought about doing a new edition, I went to Garchin Rinpoche and I asked for permission to, if I do, if that happens to include a commentary by him, because that was, I don't have one by him in the original, because uh, he wasn't teaching about them. So I, I didn't know, at least he wasn't in the West or America at, at that time, so I didn't know about his interest. And uh, <laughs> it was funny. When I was talking to him about it, Garchin Rinpoche said, um, he said, uh, Prayer, he, he was, I thought it was very him. He said, uh, prayer wheels are uh, like a washing machine for your mind. He said, uh, you know, the, the, he said that, he said, um, everybody has a washing machine in their house. And then he said, you know, they wash their clothes, but the prayer was like the washing machine for their mind. And he has a, you know, he, he teaches the same benefits that Lama Zubrashe does, but he also makes a point that um, he uses, he also points out the non distractedness that if you're, he said, he, he kind of he prefers small prayer wells like this size, and he says, you know, if you're if you're all the time turning one, that uh, he had a practical instruction I thought which was quite useful, which is he said he he does it a lot in his practice as he's doing other other practices, and he makes a point that it helps with non distraction because part of your mind you know your mind can't drift away too much or the prayer will bounce around, so he was saying that um turning the prayer wheel helps you even if you're doing other practices like Mahamudra or. Dzogchen or sadhana, spinning the prayer wheel can help to keep your mind in a state of non-distraction was uh, an, a, a point he made. Um, yeah. So, um, and I hope, yes, for through these different examples I brought, you can see different examples of how prayer wheels look and how they're made and so on. Um, usually traditional Tibetan handheld ones are metal, um, you know, kind of um, quite pretty oftentimes metal. Um, and I sh and uh, one point I'll say too is I in the both Holy Land prayers, which are those friends Micha and Ayelet in um, Israel, and then Heartwood prayers, I think is another friend uh, in um, California who makes them. Those are all with uh, microfilm, so those have uh, many mantras in them, not as many as the nanotechnology. I don't know anybody who's doing the handheld yet with the uh, nanotechnology. It was somebody making them in um, Singapore, and that's where I got the one. Uh, somebody gave, actually, American, somebody who was living in California gave me this the nanotech one as a gift, but um, I don't think they're being made commercially yet. I'm sure they will be eventually. Um, <clears throat> but I just want to go back to one more, before we conclude, Say I'll say a couple more things. Um, So one is, you know, if you if you are somewhere where there is a prayer wheel, um, it really is. Uh, 
it's a wonderful practice actually to turn them and to imagine the light rays going out, even if you do it very briefly, and even if you say a few mani mantras. But um, you know, and then if you get one, if you get one, that's really great. They're they're not. You can get them many places online. I gave examples where because they're quite beautiful and they have the um, they're filled properly with the microfilm. You know, if you order one, just like sometimes there are like shops that just sell like the very inexpensive metal ones, and that's great. Um, but do if you buy one like that, I would say make sure open it up and make sure it's filled properly. Because sometimes I, I've bought many parables over the years, and some of them are filled properly, but sometimes the ones I got in like shops didn't actually have mantras inside, they just had newsprint or something. Like so you have to then I had to take it out and put mantras in, uh, which was fine, but but do make sure you that it's filled properly. Um and all the mantras should be upright you know um and they're spun on it's in the book it describes it but they're they're spun on sort of facing outward it's different they're you know um when you have a stupa you have these like rolls of mantras in them and they're sort of um facing inward whereas in the prayer well they're facing outward because you're imagining the light rays going out for the uh, sentient beings um so you want it to be um upright and facing outward and where the om attaches like if it's Omani Pemung, the Om attaches to the life tree and then it's spun clockwise. You spin the prayer, prayer wheel clockwise to wind the mantras on. And that's how they're filled. <clears throat> um, but maybe I'll just share one more personal. Uh, so at one point, oh, I'll say a few, share a few more things. One is, uh, yeah, Lama Zobramshe really always emphasized, and this is why, like, a, if he, if more, I mean, he, he, had a, he initiated a project to build 100,000 prayer wheels. In, how many, you know, and they should all be like, he's talking about not just the handheld ones, but like the large freestanding ones, at least the size of a person, if not, you know, some of them are 20 or 30 feet or something. But um, yeah, so Lama Zermache initiated a project to build 100,000. So I don't know how many have been built, but many uh, around the world so far. Many more, I'm sure, will be uh, and are being built now. But um, he was always, he often emphasized that having a prayer will in a place lessens the place, you know, and, and he said, he would, he noted that, that, uh, when you have those large ones, especially that many people had noted that it, the place felt different, that it was easier to practice Dharma there, that it was kind of came a special feeling in the place when there was um, a prayer will there. That was a point that uh, Lama Zobrashe made. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, if there, if there's, I'll just share two more maybe personal reflections before we stop. One is, um, One is for for me personally. I'll say, say like I, I've, I, as I said, I found the I find, I've found the practice to be wonderful over the years. And um, you know, I, I do other practices, of course, quite a bit. But um, one thing I found is that like for me, if I'm caught up in um, like a uh, say right, there have been times in the last what, few years when. Uh, the pandemic and the political situation and um, wars when you know things can seem disturbing uh, upsetting and for me personally i'll just say at those times just sitting down and doing the prayer practice has been a humongous help um you know uh so it's like I've sometimes said that for my for myself. It's just my own experience that when things seem quite dark to me personally, um, the prayer practice has been a way of reconnecting with um, light. Uh, and um, you know, and with you know, because like you know, they're what's there to say, right? bringing the bringing what you want to bring into the world you know that that's really what the practice allows you as i think for me the practice has been a gift in the sense that when it's hard to when it's been in moments hard to feel like i can bring what i want to bring into the world the prayer will practice is a way of doing that uh and then uh, now that's one point another point that many people emphasize so you know lama zobrashe made this point about the environment then also, I was making this point about you know when things seem dark or difficult, the prayer will can be a way of reconnecting. You know, it's like I was thinking it was like 
when I pick up the pearl, I sometimes think of like touching, holding Avalokiteshvara's hand or something. You know, it's like you're you're connecting to something um, good. Um, and to a practice of goodness, you know, and uh, it's always Dalai Lama often says, right, if we want to bring peace to the world, we have to first do an inner disarmament, you know, and that's what the, actually, I think the pearl practice is that, isn't it? You know, if you think about what the actual visualizations are, right, you know, so you include, you know, uh, the most disturbing, you know, the person who's starting the war, the person who's starting the conflict, the person who's saying something hateful, you know, you don't think of them as evil, you think of them as, you know, you, you think of them as a future Buddha, right, as somebody with Buddha nature, and you're the first realm, I mean, the first round, rather, of light rays is just helping remove the obstructions that obstruct your own and their Buddha nature, right, the anger, hatred, craving, greed, and so on. So it's a great practice for such times is another point. Uh, and then another thing that's often been emphasized by people is um, that uh, the prayer will also, it says in the commentaries, you know, it's, it's, a, it's said to be a practice of purification. Um, you know, so if you, um, so it's a way of purifying your own uh, karma. And Lama Zobrashe in his uh, introduction and, and when he used to teach about it, he used to say that, that, uh, the prayer well is a very powerful way of practicing karmic purification. So you can actually, you know, spin the prayer well and um, think about your own negative karmas, generate the four powers of regret, and really, um, you know, use that to purify your negative karma. Lama Zobrashe also says it can be used for healing. He says like, so, um, and I think that he says that was traditionally done and um, at times in, I guess, where he grew up in Nepal, um, but he says that uh, there one uh, does the practice and imagines the the you know both the illness itself but also the karma causes of the illness being extracted and purified. And he says that's a, a healing practice. You can do it for yourself or for others. So it's that's another way of using the prayer wheel. Um, and uh, any other points? I'm just sharing a couple of things from Lama Um Oh, that was the last thing I was going to say also. Um, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but uh, Lama's Orbership was also in his, his, his introduction. He often taught about this. You know, suspending the peril has its benefit. And then he was saying also just saying the mantra, oh, money payment has certain benefits. And um, he was he was the one who taught that point, which comes from the Tantra, actually. Uh, that um, if you do, if somebody does 10 malas a day of, of oh, money payment, that was what I was saying then, uh, you know, if you touch water, it bless your body blesses the water. Yeah, she said, if you get cremated, the smoke from your body will benefit the environment. You know, like if or if you get buried, your body. So if you said that many mantras a day, you know, if you're buried, your body will bless the earth. If you um, oh, two, um, you know, and if you uh, touch water, your body blesses the water, and if you so on. And then he said, um. Uh, he said, yeah, if you touch another person, then that benefits, you know, they, they, like if you hold somebody's hand or you do a healing, it benefits them. And then um, you make their present life better and their future lives better. And then he said, oh, seven generations. Sorry. He said, if you if you recite 1,000 Om Mani Pei Hungs a day, then your children and grandchildren and so on for seven generations will not be reborn in the lower realms. This is because uh, your body was blessed by the mantra and their bodies are descended and connected to your body. So their bodies will carry these blessings and it will affect their minds at the time of death and prevent them from rebirth in the lower realms. So he was saying that um, reciting even 1,000 Omani Pemehungs a day while spending the prayer while not uh, has that kind of benefit, that it benefits your, um, you know, all those people who you come across, but also your um, descendants for seven generations. Um, and... Uh, I'll just conclude where kind of where I started is like, so, you know, if, if you are, I mean, uh, just, well, maybe I'll say it this way, like to pause just one last time and to reflect on what's that like, actually, like it's a certain worldview, right? This, the prayer world practice is connected to a, a Mahayana and Vajrayana view of the world. 
And that worldview doesn't contradict the teaching of the Four Noble Truths, right? The teaching of the Four Noble Truths says, you know, there is suffering, there's a cause of suffering, there's an end to suffering, there's a path to the end of suffering, right? This teaching doesn't contradict that. Um, this teaching agrees with that. That's why the compassion, right? That, that when one responds to the suffering of oneself and of others, kind of limitless others with compassion is the essence of what the prayer practice is, right? Um, and also the prayer practice is saying, you know, um, is, is based in a worldview that understands that because things are empty of intrinsic inherent existence, they don't exist in the way we appear. They appear. We appear to ourselves. And then, you know, so we ourselves appear a certain way to ourselves, and the environment appears a certain way to us, and others appear a certain way to us. But none of those things exist in the way they appear, right? And that the ultimate nature of our own mind is Buddha nature. The ultimate nature of others' minds is Buddha nature. Right? And that Buddha nature is temporarily uh, obscured by the mental afflictions, which are the cause of suffering, right? Uh, in terms of the noble truths. And um, so, you know, um, the prayer practice is grounded in that kind of understanding, right? That your the ultimate nature of your mind is emptiness, which is your Buddha nature. The ultimate nature of others' minds is emptiness, which is their Buddha nature. <clears throat> and so, um, beings are suffering, but beings also have the potential to become Buddhas, you yourself and others. And the prayer practice is like an invitation right, to recognize your own Buddha nature, others' Buddha nature, and to relate to yourself and others from that perspective. And they say that's actually in the Uttara Tantra. It says that, right? That when when bodhisattvas go around and see beings, what they see actually, right? They look at beings and they see that those beings are um, future Buddhas, right? And how can I help them? How can I help those beings uh, uh, who are suffering to, um, to discover their own Buddha nature? So the prayer will practice is like, it's a practice for doing that. And it's also an invitation to, to see yourself and to see others in that way. Um, and again, I was, and I think there's something quite wonderful about the physical object, you know, because uh, when we're studying and contemplating, it's, we can remember it, we, hopefully we can relate to that teaching of Buddha nature. Um, but as Gartner Rinpoche said, right, the continual turning of the prayer will keeps us in an awareness of it. Make sense? It's like a practice of ongoing awareness of it. And um, and each time you lift up the prayer wheel and turn it, if you were to go up to one, if there's one in the center where you are or a place where you are or in your home or something, it's a reminder of that, right? That your home, like, you know, so it said in the commentary, right? Your home becomes like Avalok, the equivalent of Avalokiteshvara's Pure Land. Actually, though, your home never was, you know, like right, in other words, it's a bunch of boards or rocks or nails or it's not a, it actually it's it exists as a home merely dependent upon parts and upon the label and so on right and um and then you view it a certain way right so you might view your home as a place of love or a place of hate a place of peace or a place of conflict a place of whatever um the prayer practice is an invitation to recognize you know how you view your home is dependent upon you actually and the prayer wheel is an invitation to view your home as a pure land. So, and others as future Buddhas and, and the places you go as, um, you know, yeah, pure and infused with love and compassion. So, um, that's right time. But I want to, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for sort of joining and getting a little exposure to this idea. And, um, you know, if you know, if you go to if you're near Dan Kell, go and spend the prayer wheel there. You know, prayer wheels there. If you're um, you know, and and again, you know, you know, if if you there are those resources where you can order uh hand turned ones, but or if you like, you can just then get one and fill it, you know. But there it's a wonderful, fun, delightful practice to do. Yeah, that's my uh, Putin, That's my experience too. Um, for me, yeah, when there's war and conflict, it's great to do the prayer practice.
uh, in particular. But um, so it's just we can just um, dedicate our merits. Actually, I'll, I'll personally want to dedicate the merits to this. So <laughs> since I made that kind of impulsive st statement, you know, so through these merits, may Lama Zorpashe's vow come true. You know that all beings can have experience of of that practice of this practice. Everybody who would want to, and that um, you know. I think it's just very simply, right? Through the through the merit we created together today, may we all be able to generate love and compassion. Uh, you know, qualified by equanimity, right? So love and compassion that includes our friends, but also enemies, also strangers. Right? So may our love and compassion be limitless and and, and embrace all those beings. And may each of us, you know, each of you, each of us who've, you know been together today uh practice a path of love a path qualified by love with compassion and bodhicitta and then may we achieve through that may we achieve all the qualities of uh avalokiteshra and tara but as a compassion an act of compassion then may we bring that kind of enlightened activity that they bring just as holiness the dalai lama does may we become like that bringing such enlightened activities to all beings everywhere well, thanks thank you so much lauren lauren thank you so much this was fantastic oh good good thank you lauren yep. love really really wonderful oh good good to, good to yeah you. yeah have a great day bye-bye thank you thank you lauren that was wonderful oh good to come see back you. come back soon oh anytime sure Next thank year. you lauren <laughs>